Thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, Back to Business, Pasture Recovery and Management for the Cuddly Creek Fire. My name is Tasha McGregor and I'm with the Department of Primary Industries and Regions SA and I'll be your host for this evening's webinar. Tonight's webinar is brought to you by Meat and Livestock Australia, Australian Wall Innovation in partnership with Livestock SA and Primary Industries and Regions SA. Our first presenter tonight is Joe Keynes. Joe is a partner in the Kitan Station, and a which is a family farming business operating at Kitan in the southeast, and is principally grazing merino sheep, Angus cattle, and first cross lambs. Joe has extensive livestock and grazing knowledge, um, and his resume was just too big to put in this bio, Joe. Um, as a representative on numerous industry boards and associations, but most importantly, he's the current chair of Livestock SA. But tonight he's been um, invited to speak to you, not because of uh, his extensive resume, but his experience, personal experience of being impacted by the Eden Valley and Hutton Vale fires in 2014. So now I'm going to hand over to Joe, who's going to start his presentation. Uh, as um, Tasha just mentioned, uh, we were impacted by the Eden Valley fire in January 2014. It burnt out 25,000 hectares of of country uh, on a pretty ordinary day, as all fires are, but uh, uh, we were fortunate there was in that fire there was no loss of life. There were a number of houses um, burnt, but uh, and not huge stock losses, but there were numbers of stock lost. And uh, that fire went from south to north. We were impacted by the cool change that came in the evening. So by the time it wrote, got to um, our property, it was actually in the evening and it was a bit cooler than it would have been had it happened during the middle of the day. So we were fortunate that way, but uh, as Tasha just mentioned, we were also impacted by the November fire coming of that same year, uh, coming from Hutton, Hutton Vale, uh, east or sort of just um, uh, east of Anguston, and that uh, traversed our property from west to east. Not as bad, but still did some uh, losses uh, for fencing and uh, obviously impacted our pastures a bit. So I guess as uh, Tash has mentioned, we're mostly sheep grazing. In fact, uh, we don't have any cattle on Cane Station at the moment. We're uh, all merino and uh, crossbred lambs, uh, merino, self-replacing merino, and then breeding um, uh, border Leicester crosses uh, for um, for uh, selling on to uh, um, producers down in the southeast, at, uh, or mostly around Mount Gambia. Uh, I guess one of our changes in the last last well, we've been doing since. 2002, but it's become a regular occurrence now. It was a one in a five five year event we thought, but uh, now it's pretty been annual for the last four years. And that's uh, we have all our ewes locked up in containment lots over the summer. And they started in November, and thankfully we've had a bit of rain this year. Though we're just releasing them for uh, a first of June uh, landing, so uh, we're really fortunate to be able to get them out onto a little bit of green feed, uh, still being supplemented. I guess that's our business at the moment. As I mentioned, the burn on our country and this photo here is showing you uh, some of the recovery after the fire, but that that's uh, a fairly typical snapshot of our native grass pastures, uh, of which it, the fire almost completely impacted all of our eastern country, and that, that is all uh, undulating, hilly grazing, uh, but filled with uh, non-arable, and filled with um, native pastures. So it was a cool burn, and we were fortunate, as you can see here, this was still in the middle of the summer, this fire, this uh, photo. Uh, we we did receive a rain, just uh, like uh, you people in the Cuddly Creek fire. Uh, and uh, so we did have some good recovery of non natives, but we still really are struggling even now. Uh, probably, I think the annuals, the grasses, have, the annual grasses have certainly reduced we haven't been able to get them back into our landscape, but I'd have to actually um, suggest that uh, I think the drought's having more of an effect than uh, perhaps um, the fires did. Um, I think I'd just move on now. Our weeds, uh, certainly out in the hills, as I say, our annual grasses have gone, but our geraniums and those sort of weeds are still there. I'll just note on our, the improved pastures that did get burnt, 
one of the things that I did notice, uh, we we'd actually got rid of Blue Jane through the, the weevil that uh, the NRM board had released on our property. I noticed that we had a lot more incursion of South Ocean Jane after or Blue Jane after that fire, and I think the weevils might have uh, not survived through the fire. And as I say, for most of our improved pastures, it was a cool burn. They improved, they, they kept coming back pretty well, but it, uh, and I think now we're, our perennial pastures are being impacted on the drought uh, over the last three years. Um, one of the things uh, uh, I just wanted to highlight is it is really important to have planning and we spent a lot of time planning as our fences were, were burnt. And this is actually a photo of some uh, area after the fire. We actually uh, impact, we put into our planning process areas of native vegetation that we could perhaps protect uh, given that we're going to put a fence in. Where is the appropriate place to actually really Think about some fencing, and we actually got some advice. We, we got a number of people coming in a, uh, as an in an advisory capacity to, to help us through that program. And I think it's uh, really important to um, ensure that you have this opportunity to to refence and rebuild, but it's also a, a really good opportunity to access those people with some knowledge and some uh, expertise to actually help you make sure that you um, rebuild in in the in the best fashion that you possibly can. I would just talk about, we I'll just perhaps talk quickly, whilst there's a focus on perennial pastures and, and we certainly need to have those as, as a part of our grazing uh, systems, but we're certainly at Cainton now, given that our rainfall has, has reduced over time. Uh, we had 200 millimetres of rainfall over our growing season last year. We have gone to an annual program of, of seeding annual grasses. So we've been using uh, mixtures of true kali, oats, rye grasses, turnips, clovers, rye corns, to name a few. As I said, we put 200 millimetre rainfall last year over our growing season. It provided some really fantastic feed, and we've been doing it for a couple of years. We're doing it now as we speak. Uh, we had uh, a growth rate of 200 grams uh, per day on our merino lambs. They were on a 40 hectare paddock for five weeks on rotation, uh, and after two grazings, we assessed it at about six to seven tons. They were there for five weeks and had a number of grazes. In fact, it dried off before we could actually use it uh, to, the, to the full efficiency. So it just gives us some confidence that these annual pastures for us uh, are going to be a part of our, um, our, our farming system in the future. Producers all out having a look, in, assessing the recovery of the native grasses. There have been a few projects uh, that were done in our area that. Uh, engage with all of us as producers. I think it's really important to get some one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, advice if, you, if, if it's available and, and it was. We, we used the person for about two or three work, uh, two or three one-on-one -on -one sessions to help us work through some of the issues. But it, we all also found it very valuable in joining with a farmer group to talk about the issues of native grass pastures uh, in this instance. So it's, uh, group of us uh, just assessing pastures recovery and, and what we might do to keep managing them over over time. Uh, that has been a really valuable part, just the, the group discussions and, and throwing around ideas. And I'd encourage anyone who would like to, to to avail themselves of a group. And I perhaps could mention, I'm going to do a bit of a plug now because uh, the Barossa Improved Grazing Group um, has done a lot of work uh, around um, bushfire recovery. Uh, if you search for them on biggroup.org.au, uh, they've got a videos on long-term pasture renewal. Uh, they've got some fact sheets on short-term and long-term measures to think about. And they've also got some case studies which include fencing and things like that. So if you've got onto that Bross Improved Grazing Group.org.au, um, they they've got those uh, resources there free of charge. And if you would like to be a member, my daughter is, is, happens to be uh, one of the coordinators and she suggested that um, she would encourage you to become a member as well. And, and so I can't remember the fee, but it's not very much. And I see a lot of, around a lot of information and then you also can get involved in their, their workshops and things. So if you found that you'd like to join a group, they certainly would welcome you. That's really me, Dan. I hope people have got questions. I hope I'm asking or answering you some of your uh, queries. Well, let's have a look here. Uh, Joe, we do have a question here. Does your hill country get any super? 
Uh, no. Um, historically, uh, probably getting a long time now, 40 or so years ago, uh, we used to have some of it aerial spread, but we actually haven't done that any since. Uh, we've been sort of working on our more improved country and putting fertiliser onto that. They did do a fertiliser trial uh, on our hills that, um, and, uh, that was done some years ago and there did appear to be some benefits. So we felt that that would be something we might explore uh, going forward. But you know, the only way to do it is by air. Uh, and, uh, but it, is, it was something we, we have considered again. Um, my father, who did the aerial super spreading in the first place, um, made the comment that it made the wild oats, instead of being two foot high, it made it six foot high, so he didn't think it was worthwhile. But I suspect th there may be some benefit in aerial super spreading. Joe, now that you've sort of gone through that whole recovery uh, process, re reflecting back, is there anything that you would perhaps do differently? No, I think we sought advice. We were very fortunate and we had a supportive community. We had a supportive stock agent that did a lot of things post the fire and then the recovery allowed us to get on with some of the recovery. But no, it's a longer term thing. And, and really, no, I, I think we did, uh, as, a group, as a family, we, we actually ensured that we engaged with a, a, some one-on-one -on -one people, you know, some people one-on-one. -on -one. We were working, we did do some, uh, recovery workshops with the big group or, or with the NRM board and we found those valuable just as much as anything to discuss about the situation you've been through but also to talk about where you where you thought the future was going to be and, and to discuss those things I think was really valuable for a number of re on a number of levels. What cultivation did you carry out preceding? No cultivation we have purchased a direct drill a, um, a disc seeder um, so we use that, we do use some chemical to, to do some knockdowns. But we did some dry seeding last year that was reasonably successful. Uh, but this year, given the season has broken nice and early and, and hopefully will continue for us all, um, we've, we've taken the uh, opportunity to, to spray out some weeds and then direct through. So we do no cultivation. Just got a question here. What sort of planning did you undertake um, to in to aid your recovery, I guess, Joe, in terms of, you know, when the bushfires initially gone through, it can be quite an overwhelming experience. Um, you know, what was the planning process that you went through? Uh, I guess, I mean, the, the immediate, which all of the um, people who were affected by the Cudley Creek fire are well through, is, is that immediate shock of what do we do now? Uh, we had a lot of livestock that um, with, with very little feed, so, we were really fortunate to do some immediate um, uh, planning with our uh, livestock agent to uh, get some uh, short-term adjustment uh, right, right around the state, mostly in the mid-north, but even southeast and, and places. So that gave us the opportunity to actually um, sit back. We didn't have to worry about the livestock. We could get on with planning about the fencing and, and things like that. Uh, the NRM board, as I've mentioned, had some one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, were funding some one-on-one -on -one sessions. And we used uh, an advisor that we've used for other projects of ours um, for two or three meetings to just sit down as a group, as a family, to talk through all of the issues, work out what we might do around pasture renovations, about pastures, about uh, when, you know, fencing and uh, how we'd back, uh, introduce the stock back onto the farm, things like that. So there were a lot of things, things that we talked about, but we had a, 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 an advisor with us to to sort of hold our hand, I'd suggest, uh, uh, and I think that was really valuable. Yeah, it actually, it can be quite a, an overwhelming experience. There's so many things that you, you need to consider. Um, what changes did you make post-fire? Uh, well, we've, we've changed some of the fencing yep. uh, areas that we've done. Uh, as I said, we've fenced off a few re you know, areas of, of, of native veg that, um, we've been able to protect. Uh, so there's a number of things like that. Uh, given that our hills country that was burned in the first fire is really um, encased by stone walls, they didn't burn, thankfully. Uh, some of it is encased by stone walls, but we, we didn't do a lot out there, except it was really more for the management of that country. We tried to enhance and make sure the native grasses got the best chance possible to recover, because uh, they actually helped drive that system. Uh, and also, we were hoping that um, uh, our reduced stocking rates there 
uh, would also help and kind of get the native, uh, sorry, the annual pastures, uh, the annual grasses going as well. That unfortunately hasn't happened, but I think that is more of the impact of the drought of the last three or four years so, uh, given, uh, in our eastern country. So uh, there was a lot of things that we did think about and a lot of things we, we, but we didn't change lots and lots. It was really working through the process to make sure that everything that we were doing was the best that we could possibly do. Excellent, thanks Joe. We might just uh, leave it there. Our second uh, presenter for tonight, tonight's webinar is Tim Prance from Tim Prance uh, Consulting. Uh, Tim has 40 years experience in farm consulting, specialising in pasture production and management, pasture utilisation, soil, plant and animal nutrition. He's also presented several industry workshops and programs, including uh, Prograze, Lifetime U and Dairy Forage Skills. He's also extremely experienced uh, working with farmer groups, um, especially tackling issues such as business analysis and benchmarking. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about pasture recovery after, after a fire, um, which is largely based on, uh, on my experiences going back to the uh, 1983 Ash Wednesday fires in the hills and the southeast. And then we've had a number of fires since then of which, in which I've been involved with pasture a recovery work following those fires. I think as you've already, uh, most of you have probably discovered, yeah, pastures bounce back better than what you expect, but there are a couple of caveats. I think the first one is, is, is most important, and that is the, if the soil fertility, if your soil fertility is poor in, the past, in, your, in your pasture paddocks, then the pasture recovery is going to be a lot slower. So it's really important that uh, if you know if you, if if your pH if your soils are really acid and they need lime, well then you need to be considering a liming program, and and getting your phosphorus and sulphur levels up to the critical levels. Obviously, it's a bit too late to put out lime right now, but uh, you certainly need to know what your pH is so that you can address that problem uh, this coming summer. Then the other key issue is is just making sure the pastures are spilled after the break and I've got some photos a little bit later to show, just indicate what sort of stage you need to spell them to. But just at this stage, just bear in mind, it's the, the feed's going to be really high quality, even if it's cut weed and geranium, it's still very high quality because there's just no dry feed there or the dry feed's got burnt in the fire. So feed's very high quality, it's very palatable to livestock and therefore they're really going to guts into it. So you just got to give those pastures a, a time to to get up to a sufficient height so that they can stand grazing. Um, and as you've already discovered, you know your pastures will be weedy and particularly cape weed and geranium. And there will also be quite a lot of clover, although uh, unfortunately some of the clover was lost due to the uh, false break and that's been swamped by cape weed and geranium. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. The really positive thing is that uh, you'll find that just about all your grassy weeds have gone out of, the, out of your pastures. So it's barley grass, silver grass, annual um, um, brome grass and annual rye grass, which means that, that you won't have those troubles with the troublesome grasses, but it means you're going to be lacking a little bit in winter feed. So if you haven't already done so, it would be a good idea to over sow some annual rye grass. And I'll talk a bit about that later as well. Um, as far as the impact on perennial grasses, I'm pretty sure you'll find that that impact will be minimal unless the, unless the soil fertility was really low. If soil fertility is low, then the plants won't have very good root systems. And if they don't have good root systems, they're not very tolerant of fire. But if the plants are well established with good root systems, they are tolerant of fire, especially phalaris and coxfoot even similar. Um, perennial ryegrass is also moderately tolerant, but as a lot of you probably found out, it's not drought tolerant. So as Joe touched on one of the issues in the last uh, few years has probably been as much the dry, you know, short springs and dry summers. And uh, so you couple that with the fire effect then that is not so good on perennial ryegrass. Um, I don't know how many people have got lucin, but lucin is extremely tolerant of fire and also does slow down the impact of a fire. Now, the only situation where there might be an issue with, 
with fire damage on perennials would be if there's a lot of carryover dry feed. So if any of you had, you know, dry feed that was sort of two foot high, and that means a fire would have burnt really hot. And when those fires burn hot, then that can affect perennials. But normally if there's not a lot of dry feed, then the, the fire sweeps over the paddocks pretty quickly and uh, the effect on perennials is minimal. Now I'll just go, when I assess pastures, I like to use these little squares called quadrants. And that one is 400 mil by 250 mil, which is 0.1 of a square meter. Now you can make just one of those up with a piece of wire or a bit of four mil rod. And the only aim of those is just that it just enables you to focus on, on an area in the paddock rather than just looking, looking ahead or looking at what you might, depending with your optimist or pessimist, uh, looking at the bare ground or just looking at the really good bits. This quadrant enables you to focus on a part of the paddock and do it randomly. And I'd suggest you do at least 10 of those assessments in a paddock. And the assessments just take the part of just, first of all, just working how much cover there is. So in this particular case, if you pushed all of the cover, all those leaves, that's the flarus pasture. If you pushed all the leaves up into one end, it would cover 70%. So we say there's 70% cover. I'll do a little bit more about that. So this is really where the, the pasture benchmarks come into it. So an ideal benchmark for a perennial ryegrass would be six or 10 plants in, a, in one of those quadrants, whereas Phalaris, Coxwood and Fescue, it's about two because the plants are much bigger. And as I've indicated, the ideal ground cover is, is around 70%. And ideally within those quadrants, you should have 10 subclover plants or between 10 and 100 subclover plants. So the, the idea of the aim of, of um, Assessing pastures is just to see whether they're up to scratch. And they, it may not necessarily be as a result of the fire, but it might be just the dry conditions we've had in the last couple of years. But if your pastures are not up to scratch, then this is a great opportunity to introduce a perennial grass, particularly if you've still got stock out on adjustment or if you've lost stock and you haven't been able to replace them. Um, and the, one of the big pluses will be there'll be no competition from annual grasses. So really all you've got to do is spray out your broadleafed weeds. So if, um, so just using a knockdown spray, whether you use a glyphosate or a, a spray seed top spray, but spraying out broadleafed weeds and then drilling in a perennial grass is a good option for this year. And you've still got time to do that as long as you've done it before the end of May. You know, the good thing is this year we've had a terrific germination and we don't have any annual grasses to contend with. You know, any other year we'd say you really must spray top your pastures in spring before putting a perennial in the following year. Well, the fire's already done the spray topping for you. And if you're not renovating your pastures, then I'd suggest you'd need to be looking at some sort of spray graze and ideally that should be done before the middle of June. So that's a sort of, yeah, depending on what um, vineyards you've got close by, you'd need to be just to be careful of, of spray drift. But if you can pick, go to your local reseller and get a suitable product for a spray grazing, then that's a very effective way of controlling cape weed and geranium. As long as, as long as it's done early, which then gives you clover time to recover and your weeds are still quite small. So when to start grazing. So I've got that picture on the uh, left there of a subclover. So you can see when a subclover germinates, you've got the little cotyledon leaves. Then you get what we call a spade leaf. And then we've got these th trifoliate leaves. Now really there should be three of those trifoliate leaves before you start grazing. So that's what you should be looking at when you get your quadrant out and have a bit of a look at what's there. Um, how, how many of the plants have got those trifoliate leaves on there. Now, if, if you find that they've only got these, one of those trifoliate leaves and all the rest is cape weed and geranium, then you, you do need to look at a spray grazing and it's probably worth just going in early with that, even though the clover is only at the one trifoliate leaf stage because uh, it's better to get the weeds when they're small. And just the other picture there of the matchbox on its side, that's about how high 
your perennial should be before you start grazing them. And the stubby is on its side, that's about as you don't want to get any higher than that. But uh, it's probably not an issue at this stage, but with the matchbox on its side, that's about where your perennials need to be before you start grazing them. Um, just a couple of photos here of a, of a property at Harrogate I visited last week. And you can see like um, that, if you've got that amount of cape weed in your pasture, I'd suggest you would need to spray it before you sow a new pasture. Whether that new pasture is annual, an annual ryegrass, or whether it's perennial, I, I think it would need to be sprayed with a knockdown before you put your new pasture in, because it's just too thick. If you've, if you've only got scattered plants, then it's, you probably take a chance and drill in a new pasture without, without spraying. Um, this particular paddock um, was a, a flarus paddock at, at the woodside that got burnt in the fire. And that uh, farmer there has already direct drilled that. He didn't use any sprays. He just direct drilled to fill in the bare spots in between the flarus. And that was done 10 days ago. And you probably can't see in the photo, but there is there are, there are drill rows through there and the ryegrass is just starting to germinate. But unless you apply a knockdown, it's too late to do that now. So this guy got organised and he did all his direct drilling uh, between 10 days and two weeks ago. And it's been very, very effective. And uh, I think that's my last, no, second to last one. The last slide of um, just shows that what happens if you can get barley and annual ryegrass in, which Joe touched on that. I mean, annuals are terrific for early feed if you get them in early. Uh, this paddock was actually sown in early April and uh, he's already got um, probably a thousand, nearly a thousand kilos of feed in there. So really, really, just a really wonderful paddock and he's gonna have enough trouble getting enough stock on it, I suggest. But that's, the that secret there was just getting in, getting, that was done dry and it was done early. Now I realise it's going to be a little too late for a lot of you guys to to do that now, but that's maybe something to think about another year. For, for this year, I think the issue is going to be just controlling um, controlling cape weed and and geranium. And if you if you're under stock, then um, getting a perennial established. I've got just one more, and that is just a bit of a warning that. Um, like all, I, as long as I can remember, all of our major weed issues have, 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 all, have all occurred in districts uh, following fires and drought. And I'll just, just reiterate that if you've, if you've bought in hay or had hay donated, um, if you've been able to feed that hay out in confinement areas, that's great. Um, if you've got it in paddocks, um, then you really need to really have a close look at where the hay has been fed to make sure there's no cow trop, particularly cow trop three corner jack and innocent weed that's coming through. And a lot of those weeds may not actually come up until spring. So you really need to keep an eye on the, those paddocks right through to, um, to into summer. Um, just if you are, a, if you have had stock in confinement and you're releasing them, then that's just one of the reasons why I put up those other slides to indicate that really you should have that like height of a matchbox amount of feed in your paddocks and your clover in that three leaf stage. I don't know, Tasha, I think that's, I'm sort of happy to take, take, take some questions. questions. Yeah. All right, no, that sounds and, good, Tim. So if you've got some questions that you're wanting to propose to Tim, use the Q&A little chat box down the bottom and uh, we can get Tim to answer your questions. So. Tim, if you just wanna, hang on. Okay. There we are, some questions have come through, Tim. We've actually have a question about the stubby. Um, he just wants to know if you need to empty it before you use it as a measure. <laughs> I, I always, I'll never have full stubbies lying around like that. No, they're always empty. 
We also have a question relating to phosphorus levels, Tim, um, something that you spoke about early on in your presentation. Um, but what phosphorus levels do you need to be aiming for? Well, it does depend on your buffering index, but in the order of, I would suggest um, 30 to 40 milligrams per kilogram of available coal wool phosphorus. No worries. And we've also got in here, can you explain further the best time to start grazing clover? Three trifolate leaves, but what is what if the density is poor? Uh, doesn't really matter as long as, I mean, <laughs> uh, if, if the clover's got three trifolate leaves, that means it's got a really good root system on it. And if, if, the, if the density is poor, then the animals selectively graze the leaves and the plants are able to recover from, from their root system. But if, the, if there's only one trifolate leaf, the plants take a lot longer to recover because the roots are just not as well established. Um, but ideally, um, you want to have something in there to, so if, it depends what else is in the paddock. If, if, there's, um, if there's nothing else in it, it's a, just a great opportunity to drill in a cereal or, a, or an annual ryegrass or both just for quick feed. Tim, if we've got a paddock that's very dominant with cape weed or geranium, do I risk having doing nothing? If I, I'm sorry, do I risk having nothing if I spray graze? No, because really the spray grazing is is um, it's just making the weeds more palatable, so it doesn't actually kill them um, it, because you're using a low rate of uh, whether it's MCPA or Tigrex or or Ecopar or one of those sort of chemicals. You're using a low you know, a, a low rate, application rate. Um, uh, so you're not going to end up with a bare paddock. Um, and cape weed actually produces a lot of feed in winter. It's the main issue with cape weed is in spring when you get all the bare paddocks. So, yeah, I mean, if there's nothing else in there, you've got, I guess, an option of uh, um, either grazing it. And I think it's, you probably don't want to wait too much later than the end of May or the thought to drill in a ryegrass or cereal. Uh, you want to do that early. So if you can't do that now, maybe it's worth uh, having a go in spring with either a, you know, a fodder crop or with a spring sign phalaris or um, ryegrass pasture or coxfoot pasture. So if you have got that option of going in, I say spring, but probably late winter, you know, maybe maybe spraying the paddock out in, uh, in early August, uh, following it for uh, three or four weeks, and then sowing a new pasture at the end of August or fodder crop, a uh, brassica crop I'm talking. So Tim, what food on offer levels are recommended before grazing paddocks? Well, uh, I'd say a minimum of a thousand kilos, a thousand to 1200 kilos. Um, it does depend on the class of stock. So if, uh, if you've got ewes with lambs at foot, then you'd really want to have um, if uh, uh, between probably 12 to 1400 kilos of feed on offer. And uh, Joe spoke about having native pastures. Um, I think there might be a little bit of native pastures in the hills, but I'm not quite sure. But are there any recommendations with native pastures, Tim? Do we need to be treating them a bit differently? Um, I might be interested to see what Joe thinks there. I... Usually native pastures like to be spelled. So my oh, my feeling would be to spell until you've got that 1,200 kilos or that, at least that, that probably may be the matchbox on its side with a native pasture rather, you know, um, not, on its, not on its edge, you know, not, not flat, but perhaps a, a, a couple of centimetres high. But the really key time to spell native pastures is actually in spring and early summer so that they, uh, they can uh, flower and set seed. But I'd be interested to see what Joe thinks there. Tasha, if he wants to make a comment. Joe, do you wanna mute yourself there and are you able to make any comments? Um, I probably agree with Tim that we need to give, you need to give native pastures a really good spell and then graze them as hard as you possibly can, which is something we can't really do in our hills, but we certainly, uh, do give them a spell over the winter when we won't have any stock out there, given that 
the season's been pretty ordinary the last three or four years. We won't put anything out there until probably into the early spring uh, and towards the late spring. Um, I shouldn't say that because what we were trying to do was try and put pressure on the native on the uh, annual grasses and then allow the natives to get away over the late spring and into the summer. Mm. So we had some autumn food. But given where we are at the moment, that we're not getting that recovery of uh, annual grasses, uh, I suspect we might uh, raise them fairly uh, strategically over the over the early spring, uh, just to get that native uh, to get that uh, annual grass um, seed bank back into production again, or let it seed and then have some production next year, hopefully. Yep. Does that help? Um, yeah, no, no that's, that's good. good. That's good, Joe. Yeah. What are the animal health issues of releasing pregnant ewes onto Cape weed dominant pasture from confinement? Yes, yeah, quite uh, um, quite dangerous. So yeah, you really got to be careful there. I think the um, the secret is to make sure that they've, you've got good quality hay on hand and that they've actually had a confinement with full with a full belly of hay and that they've got access to hay in the paddock. You can do it gradually. Um, I know a guy that will just let them out for a couple of hours um, and then put them back into confinement. But um, you've, they've got to have, they've got to really have access to good quality hay. I don't, I don't know, Joe, do you want to add anything there? We don't have great amounts of cape weed, so I really can't make a comment on that, except that we, we let them out of confinement um, over a number of days and uh, allow them to still have access to barley and, and, um, and obviously to paddock feed or dry feed at least. Uh, and we, we, we found out last year that we let them out because of the season break was so late. We let them out so so late that they were actually giving some animal health problems within the feedlot because they were confined right up to the, almost the point of landing. So we actually had land losses and, yeah, some issues there. So we, when we did let them out this year, we decided to let them out, uh, and thankfully we've got a bit of green feed to, to let them onto. But we actually had preserves to dry feed to let them out now, um, sort of a month before, three four weeks before lambing, uh, uh, so that they can uh, wait and be be good and uh, not have that last stress of being in the feedlot in the containment area in that last uh, three or four weeks. We we just felt that that was too too stressful for them. So we've let them out. They now have got all the feeders out there, but they're not accessing the feeders very much. But they, it is interesting to see. You don't think they're eating, but there's certainly marks around the, you know, the feeders and they're, they're definitely still going back there to get a top up. So lush cape weed is quite, is quite dangerous. So um, you, if depending if you've got a lot of surplus feed, it may be worth spraying and depending on when your ewes are coming out of confinement, which I guess, I guess it's probably, you probably don't want to have them in there too longer, much longer because it's probably getting quite wet. Um, but if you've got the opportunity to, to mow the paddock, um, if it's really lush, then mowing the paddock and wilting it might help a bit. But I think the secret is just lots of, lots of hay and uh, make sure they've got full bellies. All right, guys, we might leave it at there. There's no more questions coming through. So, Joe, while you're on mute, would you like to talk to everyone about the MLA opportunity and the one-on-one -on -one consultancy back to business? Um, thanks, Tasha. Uh, I guess we had uh, three potential, or three major areas of, of um, impact on, on fires this year, and that was Glorid and in the southeast, uh, Kangaroo Island uh, in, uh, on obviously on the island, uh, and also um, obviously the Cudley Creek area. And they were three very significant uh, um, incidents and uh, um, our sympathies go out for those who, who are all been affected and hopefully you're uh, coming out of it a bit now. But as I suggested before, the, the ability to be able to tap into some really good consultants around South Australia that, we've, that we currently have, um, is is just really really valuable i think to to set yourself up and allow you to think about all of the possibilities going forward so i guess uh, as 
um, Livestock SA, we've been able to work with MLA and AWI, I think, to some degree, to, to actually help uh, put together some uh, free, three free one-on-one -on -one sessions with local farm management consultants. Uh, there is a range of consultants who put their name forward and they have expertise in, in various areas. And uh, the idea is that if you if you contact uh, Livestock SA, uh, they will, and then we, you, you'll have a, a bit of a chat about the areas of concern or areas of interest that you, you would like somebody to help you with. And that uh, then we'll, uh, Livestock SA will put you in contact with, a, with the appropriate um, um, consultant. Uh, whether it be Tim Prance for pastures or somebody else for, for other, other issues that you might have. Um, it's really, I, I can't, I can't um, say enough about having some support, and especially when you don't have to pay for it, just get that advice to help you see your way clear so that you actually really are um, um, setting yourself up to, to produce, a, a you know, to have a really good season uh, this year and, and be back into full production. Uh, is, is just it's invaluable to have that uh, extra extra advice, and I and I also encourage you to to seek out and and be involved in. Yeah, that's that's, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct, Joe. Um, it's it's on offer to everyone that's been impacted um, in Adelaide Hills. Um, so as we all know, the Adelaide Hills has got an interesting makeup of its. Um, make up of the, the type of landholders that we have here, um, from our larger commercial properties to some of our, our smaller landholders. Um, but no, this one-on-one uh, -on -one consultancy being offered through Livestock SA um, is offered to anyone who's um, a levy payer to MLA. And, and while I've got everyone in line, I'd also like to remind them that the PERSA Emergency Response and Primary Industries grants, uh, they need to be submitted by the 31st of July. So that's coming up really quickly. Um, and if you want further details on those grants, uh, please have a look on PERS's website. Yeah, so I think that we might just finish it there. I would just like to thank everyone who's joined us for tonight's webinar. And in particular, Joe and Tim, I would like to thank you so much for sharing your insight and your expertise. We also like to thank the sponsors of this webinar, in particular, MLA and AWR. And just let you know, if you have any other technical questions regarding tonight's topic, please forward them on to Livestock SA. Um, or if you have any questions relating to the bushfire recovery grants, please contact Furza. Just like to thank you for your time tonight and have a wonderful evening. Thanks everybody. Bye.